Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raghu Balakrishnan. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering. I'm also the Michael and Catherine Burke head of ECE. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's College of Engineering Distinguished Lecture by Dr. Robert Kahn. We are in, a special, we are in for a very special treat uh, this afternoon. And what I'd like to do is to first introduce our Dean of Engineering, Dr. Meng Chang, who in turn will tell you why it is such a special treat for us. While Dr. Chang is walking up, I'd like to briefly introduce him. Dr. Meng Chiang is the John A. Edwardson Dean of the College of Engineering. His research received the 2013 Alan T. Waterman Award. His online courses and textbooks reached over a quarter million students, and he's co-founded several startup companies and a nonprofit consortium. Please join me in welcoming Dean Chiang. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Here in physical presence or in virtual presence on Facebook, which is watching you as well. <laughs> My name is Meng Chang on behalf of Purdue College of Engineering. Uh, it is such a special honor to welcome the distinguished lecturer to the grand finale of the inaugural season of the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, Dr. Robert Kahn, a living legend and a national treasure. I can spend the next one hour going through his bio and won't be able to finish. I'll be brief. Dr. Kahn, is widely known as a, one of the fathers of the internet. In particular, in 1966, Dr. Khan moved from MIT to a BBNN to start what was known as the ARPANET that led to the internet. In 1972, Dr. Khan moved from BBNN to DARPA and led the largest effort by United States government to that point to support computer and networking research and development. In 1974, Dr. Khan, together with Vint Cerf, wrote the paper that gave us TCPIP, the glue that led to the success of internet. And since then, Dr. Khan has continued to innovate including in the space of digital object architecture, MEMS exchange, and many more beyond the internet. What he did for the world and humanity in the internet invention led to numerous awards, including the IEEE Medal of Honor, the ACM Turing Award, the Japan Prize, the Queen Elizabeth Prize in Engineering, the McConney Prize, the Draper Prize, United States National Medal of Technology. I don't have my notes in front of me. Uh, I just happen to remember all these awards by heart, uh, and many more that I do not remember by heart uh, just yet. Let me just conclude this brief introduction with uh, one more distinct honor that Dr. Khan received uh, in 2004, uh, the United States Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, the highest honor can be bestowed onto a civilian of this country. So let's welcome the living legend, father of internet, Dr. Robert Khan. Thank you. So it's sufficiently bright up here. I can't really see you folks all that well, but I'll just take it for granted that you're not walking out on this lecture. So, um, What I'd like to say is that I've been focused on infrastructure development for most of the time after uh, 
taking a leave of absence from MIT while I was on the faculty. And although I've been involved in network development all the way, as Mung mentioned, I've been involved in many other things along the way, including leading the research programs at DARPA for a, for a number of years when we were the largest supporter of uh, computer science and IT R&D probably in the world. Um, and the problem with working on infrastructure is you really can't see it. Um, and so unless you have a pretty good idea of what it is, sometimes the ideas can kind of roll over you and they sound good, but you don't know what to do with them. So uh, in, the, uh, in the 1970s, I remember giving a number of talks about the internet when it was more than just an idea. We we're actually building out part of it with the research community because this was the era when you were starting to get workstations, the PC had not yet been invented or developed or made available, but people could get powerful workstations, local area nets. Um, and I remember giving a lecture in, to groups that were not involved because the people who were actively involved sort of knew what it was all about. And the reaction I often got at the end of those remarks would say, that was a very interesting lecture. I'm hoping I don't get that at the end of this one, although I hope you do find it interesting. But they would say at the end of this, tell me again why I would want an IP address. <laughs> so you just understood that, that they didn't really get it at the nuts and bolts uh, level. Um, when we started out to build the internet, uh, in fact, when we started out to do computer networking at all, the goal was to get the bits from one computer to another. And the internet simply put it in the multiple network environment where instead of just a landline net, namely ARPANET, we had a few other nets that I was involved in developing a packet radio net, which is kind of like the forerunner of today's uh, cellular systems. Um, or there was a satellite net on Intelsat 4 to link to the European research community. And the goal we had was to just get the bits from one computer to another with the idea that the users, when they got those bits there, they would navigate by fingers on a keyboard and eyes on a screen. And here we are some 45 years later, and we are still, for the most part, in the, in the paradigm of navigating, for the most part, with fingers on keyboards and eyeballs on screens. We tried to change that back in the 1980s, and I worked collaborated with and surf on this as well, and we came up with the idea of mobile programs that could run through the internet and carry out uh, you know, some of these tasks, but that came to the forefront at almost exactly the same time that the first viruses and worms and Trojan horses were being introduced into the internet environment, and so most of the organizations I thought that would be most interested in that notion that you could remove yourself from having to navigate everything, kind of educate a program as a factotum, let it loose, and it could advise you about what you needed to know about or carry out your tasks. They found that unacceptable because they were uncomfortable with the idea of somebody else's programs just showing up on their machine. I think it's time will come, but that's sort of where we have been until recently. Now you might say, why wasn't the World Wide Web the solution? And for many people, it is a very effective solution. I use it quite a bit myself, most people do. But when you look at the fundamental issues of information management, uh, they often involve proprietary information, personal information. Uh, they often involve security at different levels that have to be invoked. Uh, and it's a, it's a very difficult kind of a situation when you're especially trying to find old information. So I'll give you an example. Suppose I mean, we were involved in developing one of the most uh, widely used programming languages today. It's known as Python and along with Java and the C family. Those are the three probably most uh, widely used uh, languages. But we went to try and clear the rights to Python when we were developing it at CNRI, and the person who was involved was Guido Van Rossum, who was doing the work. Uh, and we had to go back and find out, you know, what what happened, because we had, he was at CWI in the Netherlands working on a programming language called ABC for Children. When he got hired there, what were the rules that applied to him? 
what agreements did he have in place? And we had to find out all this old information, which you couldn't do by just navigating with fingers on a keyboard. And today, we are working in a variety of different contexts with different groups that are selectively using this kind of architectural notion to deal with information, whether it's for managing supply chain for movies in Hollywood with the cable TV industry, or options trading around the globe, or uh, construction information, and most importantly, I think first out of the box were the libraries. Uh, Purdue was one of them way back when, along with the publishers who were making available their information. And so part of the architecture I'm going to describe today is not just a hypothetical. This is an architecture that in places is very widely used, but often for pieces of it, not for the whole, the whole thing. And so if you look at any technical journal from probably ACM or I, IEEE or uh, some of the medical journals, you'll see references to things like uh, digital object identifiers. Every article, and they've been doing that for probably two decades, but they have been very reluctant to make those articles actually available because they're afraid that the crown jewels of the publishing industry could be uh, affected. But I think more and more as we get to understand this, the benefits of this will uh, uh, come out and we've been having discussions about where else it could be used and I think it's a perfectly uh, good way to think about managing information in organizations, whether they be a university or a business going forward. So uh, if somebody were to tell you that uh, the electrical power infrastructure was available and you were, this was 100 or more years ago, most people said, well, what good is it? Because they didn't see the applications and they couldn't see the electrical infrastructure. And so it took a while to cause it to be built up, whether it was from public safety interests for electrical lighting outdoors in place of gas lamps. Or, or whatever, I mean, you didn't have electrical heating in your houses, you didn't have l lamps until light bulbs and the electrical infrastructure was fully in place in the homes. But, you know, people didn't see it initially, so they may not have, may not have had a good way of really understanding it. So somebody said, look, I have a billion volt wire we could put in your house. Really, the, the latest thing in infrastructure, most people wouldn't know what to do with the billion volt wire then probably would be scared about it because it sounds dangerous or something, even if you can see the transmission lines and the like. So um, I think that uh, the applications are often important to people to understand. And when we talk about managing information, uh, I have to tell you that the, the tack I'm taking here is to not solve a particular application any more than the internet or the ARPANET or any of even LANs were intended to solve a specific application. It was an infrastructural capability we were fairly sure people could take advantage of. In the original internet, as you know, it would have been a very different development if every time you wanted to have an interaction with a remote computer, you had to ask, well, where was it located? What network was it on? What protocols did it use? What gateway do I connect to? How do I route the traffic? We would not have an internet like we do today where you can just simply easily identify something and have the bits show up in the right place. But when it comes to information, it's a very different story. And if you want to manage information over very long periods, you need ways to do that effectively. So that's what this is all about. And I hope I can explain it to you in a way that makes you uh, comfortable that it's not about the technology any more than the internet was about the technology itself. So let me see if I can, does that get you to the next slide? Okay. So one of the issues that we had early on was that, you know, people were, Congress was passing laws about the internet and nobody really knew what it was. So there was an FNC definition that defined it as a global information service. They've gone back and forth on is it a telecommunications, is it a utility, is it a global information service? Because so they're regulated differently. Uh, and what's it about? Well, it was never, those protocols were never about the technology. It was all about whatever the technology was, how do you make it possible to make them work together? The computers, the networks, whatever we're talking about here. 
And the net effect is over the life of those protocols, which are still being used today, some 45 years since we first started the work, roughly, um, the scaling up of the technology has grown by something on the order of a factor of 10 million. If this goes on, we have an internet in a decade or two, especially as the internet of things grows, uh, and those protocols are still in use, we will have a scaling up of a factor of a billion or a trillion. Nothing in the history of the engineering world that I'm aware of has ever scaled up by that much. If, if that were the case, I mean, take a look at airplanes. They've gone from, what, order of magnitude 100 miles an hour to either 600 or a little bit above supersonic. You're talking about factors of 10 to 100, not a trillion. And that's the reason for that is because this architecture was never about the technology. It was all about whatever it is, enable it to work. And so if you think about the digital object architecture, it's really, in my view, a logical extension of the internet. It's based on the same architectural ideas that showed up, namely, it's an open architecture, defined interfaces and protocols. It's independent of the underlying technology. You don't have to ask, you know, are we using databases or quantum storage systems or what are the interfaces any more than we worry about tracks and sectors on disks today. And the important thing about internet, uh, the internet and, and infrastructure in general is that the most effective infrastructure developments are those that are conceptually simple in both uh, the understanding of it by users and the ability of, the, of applications to make, make use of it. And that's the case here. We, this architecture is about as minimal as you can get to manage information, which means there's a lot of room for people to adapt it to their own needs and requirements. Um, it is particularly useful for getting interoperability between different systems. And this is probably the most important comment I can make. It's a non-proprietary architecture. For many years, people have said, because we were involved in developing it, it was proprietary to my organization, um, although the funding for it actually originally came from DARPA and was an outgrowth of this work on mobile programs that Vint and I had done. But I want to tell you also that we heard the same thing about the Internet itself in the mid-1980s. So I was one of the early members of um, a new uh, board that the National Academy had set up in Washington called the Computer Science and Technology Board, I think it was called. Uh, at the time, and they were looking for things to work on, and, they, and I proposed at the time, why don't they think about the impact of the internet, which we were referring to as the national information infrastructure, as, uh, as, as, as its impacts on societies uh, will, will evolve. So take a look at that and see if you can get a handle on that. And the answer was, uh, no, we can't work on that because that's CNRI's, that's our, my organization that I still run. That's our proprietary technology. And I said, no, it isn't. This was developed with federal government support. It's a public thing. It's in the public interest. Um, two years later, the federal government actually gave the, uh, the academy some money to look into that very same problem. And they decided, oh, I guess it wasn't proprietary after all. So you have to distinguish between an architecture, which sort of lays out how things can work, and the actual implementation of it. Now, somebody might have intellectual property in an architecture, like if you're a building designer, but this is one for which there is no intellectual property in the architecture. Nobody is claiming it, certainly not us, nobody else that I'm aware of that, that really is in a position to. But the implementations of pieces of it could be proprietary. So if a, a company built a TCP IP implementation, that could be theirs, and they may want to charge for it. But anybody could then build those protocols and, and continue on with it. Now, you know, managing digital information means different things to different people. I mean, I recently gave a lecture at a World Conference on Humanities, and they were more interested in the linguistic side of things. So th this is an example of some of the things that, that came up there. That, you know, we have language in the world because it's used to create literature, and different languages produce literature in different forms. But in the computer world, the same thing is true. We have programming languages that produce computer programs. And those languages, they're not quite English, French, and Chinese, but 
And they can be Java, Python, or C++. And these programs and any other information in digital form can be structured as digital objects and manage them. And so just like the early networks that we developed were based on the notion of packets, which had addresses so that you could route them through a network, but once they got delivered, they became ephemeral. You couldn't say, I would like to gain access to the packet that was sent on such and such a network 43 years ago and expect to get it. Nobody's keeping track of that. There's no reason to. But when you're managing digital information of some import, there are many cases where you want to manage that information actually in perpetuity. If it's business information, you might want to keep it for a very long time. If it's governmental information, some of it you might really want to keep in perpetuity. And if it's laws and regulations as they might apply to various things at various points in the past, you probably want to keep all of that as well. So in this world of the digital object architecture, the digital objects are the lingua franca. Everything that I talk about is about these objects. So let me say you know, what a digital object is. In the first order, it's, it's basically a sequence of bits or a set of those sequences. So this could be a digitized version of a movie, in which case you have an audio part and a video part, and some sequencing, perhaps some subtitles, some synchronization. But it could be a chip design. It's got various aspects of it. I mean, literally anything that you can represent in digital form. And it has, and this is important, associated with it a unique persistent identifier. And that identifier uh, is sort of part of the object in some sense, but it's also something that can be resolved all on its own. So let me see if I can put this in context for you. Let's say we're in the world of the Internet of Things and we have, you know, 100 billion things. And I say, here's an identifier for the temperature readings from a particular thermostat, maybe in this auditorium. Um, and it's one of 100 billion things. You know the identifier, but how do you know that it's this thing in this particular auditorium? You're not going to try all 100 billion, so you need a way of routing the data here. You need a way to reduce this identifier to information about the thing it's identifying. We call that state information. And so the ability to resolve these identifiers is really crucial. Now, this whole issue of how you build a system like that that's meaningful, especially if individual organizations want to create their own identifiers and control their own information, and virtually all the organizations we've talked to want to do that. And so they have the ability to do it locally, but now they might have 100,000 or a million of those, and which ones of those do you then ask for the state information? So I'll tell you a little bit about how this works. This, this piece of the architecture is the most well-developed. It's in widespread use and has been for more than, I would say, 25 years. Um, Purdue was one of the early users of it in one form. There are users of it in another form today. Um, the library and publishing community has been first out of the box because they were the ones that saw the need for persistent identifiers in their digital journals that they produce. So if everything was identified with a URL, let's say, and you moved it from one machine to another uh, over time, uh, sooner or later those URLs are not going to work anymore. And they didn't want to have to change all of those citation indices at the back. So that's the way it is today, and that's the way things actually work. Now, a digital object typically will incorporate a work, and that's how people thought about it earlier, a work being an in corporeal creation in the world of copyright for which you have to actually reduce it to a form of um, particular expression. Um, but it could be something in which a party has rights or interests, like a contract, or in which there is value. And at the end of this particular talk, there's a set of references, if you make these slides available, uh, that references the paper on representing value as digital objects which I think is one of the first papers that actually talks about minting a cryptographic string uh, as, as it evolved. As it evolved uh, in, and you probably have seen that more recently in the form of all the cryptocurrency stuff and blockchains. And I've given a number of talks on blockchains, which in my view are just simply a particular way of structuring a digital object. So I think this is a context that applies very broadly. And there's a very uh, motivated and uh, 
and, and encourage a group of folks that are looking at blockchains as something they're particularly interested in. But I think this is a more general way to think about that problem. So basically, any kind of information is, um, that's in digital form can be st structured and represented as a digital object. And if you think about that in some longer term form, you know, if a piece of information shows up in your machine, it'd be very nice to have some context about it. What is it? What's its provenance? Where did it come from? Um, and so having an ability to do that is really important. And we've been playing a role with the Research Data Alliance trying to help them understand how to deal with very large research data sets. So if somebody were to give you you know, a terabyte of research data, you're not gonna know what to do with that unless it's more finely structured and you can go through it and see what type of information is the next 20 bits or the next 500 bits or next megabyte. So these types are important and those types can be represented as identifiers as well and reduced to important information about what the type itself means. So these identifiers really are kind of the linchpin just like IP addresses are the linchpin of today's internet. Um, and they, in general, can be used to identify anything that you would like them to identify, but it's all about those things represented in digital form. So if I say, here's an identifier for an individual, I really mean that identifier will resolve to digital information about the individual that they wanted you to know, like their public key, or maybe their contact information for the day, or anything else they chose to make available. It could be about a system that you wanted to verify you're talking to the right one. It could be about content in different forms. So all of this is possible, but these identifiers are the linchpin. And the resolution system is really necessary because if all you have is an identifier, you know, our argument has been don't put semantic information in these identifiers. Because if you only understand Chinese, you're not going to understand it if it was semantics in English, and you need a resolution system in general. So put all the semantic information in the resolution system or in something that uh, you know, will serve as its, as, its, as its equivalent, like a registry or metadata. Every object we assume, therefore, has not only an identifier, but the record has a public key, and there's a public-private key pair that exists, and so you can validate the systems, the users, and the, the content through the PKI interchange, where whatever the party is that's trying to do the validation gives you uh, uh, a nonsense uh, string, like we call it a nonce, and you encrypt it with your private key, and then they can validate it, because they presumably know who you are as an identified user, to be sure you have the right public key. Now, this doesn't solve the problem of vetting the users because all it's saying is this is the person who has the public private key pair. They, the public key corresponds to the private key that that individual had. So in some cases, people will verify it off of security cards issued by trustworthy organizations and the like. Um, and the fact that this produces a PKI infrastructure really enables a lot of very interesting things because people have struggled, struggled with how to create a PKI infrastructure, but this architecture comes with it fully built in conceptually. Now, I mentioned before that um, this work came out of some work that we did on mobile programs. Um, so we produced a report. It was called The World of Nobots. This is something that I did with my colleague in surf and, and because uh, that technology was uh, viewed as uh, potentially dangerous because they didn't know what programs from who would be showing up in a world of viruses, we extracted the mo mobility part of it out and produced the equivalent of the digital object architecture, which could have mobility reintroduced at any point in time because a mobile program can be a digital object. But we're assuming right now that we're not dealing with mobility, but things in physical or structural locations within the internet uh, uh, environment. So um, what does this object architecture do? Well, first of all, it provides a conceptual framework for managing information of all kinds. And most people today don't have a framework for that. So I mean, I was asked a question, well, how does this relate to databases? Well, if you think about a database, we, people know what they are today, but 
if you took the information from that database and put it into another database, you're going to lose all the context about that information, like access control to it, provenance perhaps. And it'd be very nice if the objects themselves had the ability to self-identify themselves. So when an object moved from one place to another, that information all went along with the object. Now, whether you use a database to store it or not is immaterial, because that's just the low-level technology in this architecture. You can put it in the cloud. You can put it in multiple clouds. You can do anything you like behind the scenes, but the whole idea is that using the identifier, you should be able to then get the object or some part of the object. So the protocols for doing that enable you to deal with the information that's embedded within these digital objects. Uh, and that's something that I think is going to stand us in good stead going forward. So we're going to have to move very large files when you only want to know a small data, like a cholesterol reading or a blood pressure reading or something from a much larger record. Um, and with that kind of protocol, uh, you have the advantage of getting interoperability dealt with right off the bat. Because if the main interface to something that is uh, making these objects available, which I'll get to later, we call it a repository, if the main interface to that is based on identifiers, then every repository, regardless of what the storage mechanism, is automatically interoperable. Just like TCP IP allows for interoperability between computers of different sorts, this protocol, which is called the Digital Object Interface Protocol, DOIP, sounds like VOIP, but it isn't, all identifier base automatically allows for interoperability and will persist over the long term. Now, um, there are three components in the architecture, one of which I just mentioned. It's a repository, because you're not going to access a digital object if you can't get it from somewhere. So repositories store the objects, enable their access based on security uh, and identifiers if necessary. If it's public, then you don't care. If it's not, then you want to be sure it's only being given to people who have the right cryptographic uh, uh, validations of themselves. Um, you may not remember an identifier. Uh, if somebody sent it to you by email, fine, you might click on it. If somebody cited it in a publication, you might click on it. But suppose you're looking for uh, the laws in the state of Indiana in, okay, we'll go into the future, 2015 or 2025 or 2035. I know 15 is in the past. Um, and you're looking for a particular law on a particular topic then um, you need to be able to understand what's the identifier so that you can avoid all of the searching. So that's what registries enable because registries store metadata about the objects. So you ought to be able to search them. This architecture doesn't define what the search strategy is. So if somebody comes up with a really good PhD thesis on how to locate uh, people by photographs or music by sounds or whatever, then um, you can incorporate that at the front end of the search part. But it's the access to the metadata, which would then provide you back a list of identifiers for, for the, that or things that are closely related to that. So now you've got the identifier. What's the next step? Presumably, you'd go to the repository to access the information, unless you don't need to do that. If you just want to get a public key, maybe you don't need to go to a repository. The resolution system is the key intermediary. So by going to the resolution system, you say, here's the identifier. What's the state information about this object? It might say, here are 10 places on the internet you can go, and you can use normal routing. Or it might say, uh, it's in one particular location. Here's how you authenticate it. Here are terms and conditions for its use. Most things on the internet today, you have no clue what you can do with them when you get them. and so. Sometimes people just do what they think is reasonable, but you have a way of actually stating explicitly what you can and can't do in this particular form. Well, uh, you can think about this resolution system in a variety of ways. If you put the resolution system on a, in one location, then you've got to have the information for every object in that location. And that's a, it might be if you had a hundred billion repositories and every one of them had a you know, uh, a million entries into it, and you've got 10 to the 15th, uh, 10 to the 18th. You've got a huge number of records in one location. 
And so when we talked to people about it, they all wanted to manage their own. And so let's say you had a million organizations that were in a position to create their own identifiers and manage their own identifier records. It's like the catalog for those records, if you will. And I, as I mentioned, uh, Purdue was one of the early ones that uh, made use of this, and they still do, but it's through the, pub the publisher's mechanism right now, the DOIs. Um, which of those million would you ask? And so we ended up with a two-level system that I'll describe a little, uh, a little later, but it's in widespread use and it's pretty important. There's another effort that's ongoing for which uh, we were working with uh, both uh, NIST and uh, the National Institutes of Health, and that's to define what it means to be a type, and we're doing it uh, through the folks at ISO. Uh, if you got the ability to define types for your data, what does a type look like? If you don't have a standard way of saying what a type should look like, nobody else is gonna understand it. Unless you have a separate language above that to try and describe it. So we're trying to come up with a meta structure, a meta description of what a type looks like, but not to define any particular types. So in the medical community, they'll have their expertise that knows how to do that. In the engineering disciplines, then they'll be different from chemistry to mechanical to electrical. They can define their own type structures and there may be different ways of doing it. So you will have a way of resolving it and then you can see it in, in potentially in different languages if somebody is willing to take the time to do that. So within a digital object, every entity, every element of that object, which can be many elements, is represented as a type value pair and the whole object itself is typed. So you know what type of entity that is. Um, but the types themselves are rep represented as digital objects, and that's how you can understand for element X, you can click on the type and find out what type of element that, that is. So conceptually, that's what it looks like, and it's a little sketch I have just to show you. I, I can't see how it's clicking, but you should have on the screen in the upper right-hand corner, repositories, below it, the resolution service, to the left of that, resource discovery, which is really the metadata records, and you have a client in the upper left-hand corner, so the client will go try and discover an identifier, it'll come back, uh, he'll go to uh, the identifier resolution service to resolve it, that'll come back, that might then go to a repository to get the object, and that'll come back, and I can't see, so he's got the data he wants after some of those interactions. Um, so as I mentioned, this work started out with the work that Vint and I did in the late 80s on mobile programs, but it got elaborated in the early 90s with DARPA funding in something called the CSTR project in which we worked with a number of DARPA designated universities to actually digitize their computer science technical reports, the stuff that was in the gray literature. Um, and that was a very interesting interaction because we had a lot of discussions about identifiers where one university would say, I want to put semantics into the identifier because I want people to know it comes from my university and I'll never sell my publications to another university, particularly my PhD thesis or anything like that. And yet later on they realized the value of that and the publishers knew it right from day one because if you go to a a major publisher, they might take a whole bunch of their collections and want to sell that collection to another publisher for whatever reason, or they merge with somebody, and they don't want the train of semantics going along with it. So they want to be able to have an identifier that's sort of kind of neutral with regard to any of the semantics. Um, in 1994 or five, we set up a group of uh, companies in the United States, with like, I don't know, it was at least 50 and might have been 70 or 80, all uh, across the board, and it was an attempt to get them to understand what the internet was about. We might do the same thing for the digital object stuff once they feel comfortable having a solution that isn't owned by any one of them. Well, they understood, industry did, that they didn't own the internet at that point in time, but what was it and what are other people thinking? So we had people from semiconductors, computer software, applications, uh, computers, networking, router builders, uh, newspaper people, financial people, and we brought them all together. And there was a report that got put out in 1997. It was called uh, uh, basically something like um, Managing Access to Digital Information. And it was an approach that was based on digital objects and stated operations on those objects. 
Now, if you think about object-oriented programming, the whole point of object-oriented programming when it first came out, and I followed that very closely, uh, was to insulate the programmers from all the details of the internal structures of the program. They didn't have to worry about setting up arrays and pointers and the like. They had built-in methods that allowed you to access it. But when you're talking about intellectual property or other important things that people care about, those organizations really wanted to be able to license those interfaces. So if somebody wanted to do something with that material, they wanted the ability to have that as a licensing capability. So um, that's where stated operations came in, where you could actually indicate what kinds of operations are possible with the object for that particular individual or the public at large. And when this was first presented, um, in when, when the world was starting to think about IDs, it actually got the Digital ID World Award. I'll show you a picture of that in, in a second. Um, so that's what the report looked like. I, I scanned it in, in landscape form rather than portrait mode. So it only shows, I don't know if there's a, probably no, uh, is that a, whoops, no, it goes one way. Yeah, I, I thought there might be a laser here. But you can see there's a list of like seven companies there, I think, uh, starting with uh, the A's and it just gets up to the B's. But they're all together about uh, somewhere between 50 and 80 companies that signed on to it. There's a reference to that at the end. I commend it to you. Uh, and that's what the Digital ID World Award looked like. And it cited the bottom digital object architecture. Uh, the, the award in 2003 for balancing innovation with reality. Now, the way you actually interface with the digital object is through this protocol. And the, the protocol itself is really pretty simple. It's based on you give it an identifier, maybe your own identifier too, and then they can validate whether you should be able to get it and they know exactly what it, what it is and you can penetrate into the objects and interface with the information itself. None of the other systems do that. I mean, historically, everything about networking was based on the technology. Wires on the internet, um, machines for IP addresses, uh, files in the case of uh, URLs uh, on the web. Um, and, you know, you don't want to have, what happened? Is that me? Did I do that? Okay, there we are. So you don't want to have to be asking those kind of questions uh, in the future. Imagine somebody coming back and, and saying, okay, you want to get a copy of the law in Indiana from 2025. And it was on a machine called this back then. Let's say it's 100 years before. Well, that machine isn't going to be around, doesn't help to tell it what machine it was on back then. You just want to get it right now. Doesn't help to say what wire it was connect it was connected to via machine on the ARPANET. ARPANET's long term gone, and who knows what what networking strategies we'll be using then. You really want to be able to identify the information and and go along with it. And I think it's really the right way to be thinking about this. Um, we uh, we have a uh, an effort that we undertook to try and describe this, and it became a standard uh, through ITU, but mainly at a descriptive level, so it's not a specification for implementation, but we're about to make that available standalone from the things that now harness it. But if you look at how it works, see the red part on that slide is supposed to show sort of the front end logical processing. It takes these identifiers in, but all the digital objects are out the back end. So you don't care from a user perspective whether it's on a thumb drive, on a disk drive, on a RAID array, in a cloud service, or who knows what in the future. And in fact, it could be on multiple cloud services, which we also demonstrated, so that you know, in the future you can take those objects, port it into any other system. You can move it from cloud service to cloud service, which I think the clouds will eventually have to support, but they may not want to do it right now because they may feel like they're losing customers. But it's I think the right way to do that, and the minute you have this kind of interface to these um, repositories and, and, and even registries, then you get automatically the kind of interoperability that you get with the internet when people use TCP IP protocols. So it's kind of like the logical equivalent of that. We have a piece of software we got 
we put out on the net because people asked us. They had to download repository code. They had to download registry code, um, put them together and make them work. And they said, you know, look, repositories need registry so we know what's in the repository. It's like a local index. And guess what? Registries need repositories to store the metadata records. So it's sort of the same set of software. Can't you bundle them together, which we did. And we put out a piece of software called Cordra. It's on the cordra.org site. Um, we're about to release a second version of it with the updated version of the DOIP protocol. And no charge on that, but it does base itself on the use of handles. So you need to be able to create handles and manage handles. Well, I believe uh, Purdue can do that itself, whether they do it as DOIs or plain vanilla handles. And virtually anybody else can because that's not a profit-making op operation that uh, we or anybody else uh, tends to run. Uh, there's an experimental mode where you can try it out, and there's a regular mode where you can uh, just deal with it you know, persistently. This uh, reference out of ITU is called X1255. It came out of a working group on uh, uh, identity management information, so it's couched in terms of uh, discovery of identity management information, but that's like you know something about email which can be used for anything couched in terms of chemistry needs. This is an, e an email protocol for chemical users when in fact it's the same protocol for physics users, same protocol for housewives and whatever, whatever it is that is motivating you. This is a very general framework description and it's all based on the digital object architecture and it was adopted as a global standard in uh, 2013. Um, now, metadata is another one of those terms that people struggle with. If you ask most people, you know, what is metadata, they'll probably say it's data about data or something like that. But in fact, um, I think of it as assertions, namely, um, they can be about, uh, let's see, okay, identity. What's the resource called? Uh, provenance. Who created it? Where was it created? Access. What are the access constraints, protocols? You could have descriptions of the data, various technical parts of it, what stage in the life cycle. And then you got issues about structure and representation. Those are just examples. That's what metadata is really all about. And a metadata registry will keep that kind of, of, of information. So you might want to know you know, all kinds of uh, information where you're looking for keywords of sort or images or whatever that uh, leads to that. Now, let me just say a few words about, um, I said a lot about things and Internet of Things. Let me talk about blocks and, and blockchains briefly. Um, you know, blockchains sound like they're new, but the notion of a block is not really a new item. Anybody who's dealt with like communications knows about block coding. Uh, anybody who's dealt with deep space communication knows that if you're gonna send information and, and, and wait for an acknowledgement and retransmission, you know, it could be you know, like Mars, I think round trip is what, 10 or 15 minutes round trip. Um, and so there's a lot of latency involved in doing that. And so what people have tended to do is chain blocks. Birth trapping codes, things like that have uh, really dealt with that sort of uh, situation. So the ability to link these blocks together is not new. And of course, in the programming field, linked lists have been around for as long as I can remember. And there are various ways in which you can hook them up one to the other. Um, but the blocks were not usually managed separately from the applications, but they could be. And so the work on the blockchain stuff purports to be new. And what's really new about it is sort of the awareness that people have of the fact that cryptocurrencies can have value and that they can exist and that, that there are ways to authenticate them or evaluate them or, or, or the like. They don't require, in their view, a centralized authority, although somebody's got to be able to say how the cryptographic stuff works, how do you change it, what are the rules and requirements when you need to you know, take new actions regarding the whole system. But it's it's independent of federal, federal regulatory authorities, which many people find attractive. 
course, many other people were afraid of it for exactly that reason, and I think it, it remains to be seen how the regulators in general will deal with this as it becomes more and more prevalent around the world. I think there's going to need to be visibility at the level of the regulated communities, and they probably will mandate that in time. But you don't have to get to a system which causes everything to be replicated and stored and linked together essentially in perpetuity. One of their big problems is how do you fork a blockchain? And I was recently at, uh, gave a keynote at a blockchain summit in Australia last month, and they had some of the best coders from around the world showing up there. And I said, well, what are some of the problems you're focused on right now? And I said, well, techniques for how to fork a blockchain. And so I said, oh, really? So he said to me, how do you fork blockchains in the digital object architecture? And I said, well, <laughs> we don't have that problem because we never have to deal with that particular issue because it isn't required. And so that ended up in another long discussion that said, oh, you're blowing my mind because this is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to do it a very different way. It's a choice that you make, how to structure a digital object and how do you link things together. Whether you need to do that or not, that's, again, a choice. So um, I think the idea of using this kind of uh, uh, information and chaining things together has really come up in lots of different contexts, but uh, I think that uh, just to, to link it together, um, I, I think uh, this information about a block, which you need to know, because you need to get its identifier to deal with it, it's in the province of metadata. It can be self-contained. Um, I think uh, the amount of metadata can, in fact, be enormous. But I want to go into some more general observations and then take any questions. So I'm almost done here. Um, so I think the context for the blockchain technology has been around for many years. Um, and I believe every block is an example of a digital object. It needs to be identified, needs to be understood, needs to be persistently accessible. It's a particular way, as I said, of structuring a digital object that comprises many others. Digital objects are stored in repositories, and those can be replicated and mirrored. Um, and there are various ways to cross-check if these multiple repository entries are appropriate. And so trust in the system is really something that's inherent to it. Um, so you can have an object that never changes. And there's a very simple way to validate that kind of an object without having to have all of this other material. Like you can create an identifier for an immutable object that simply involves putting an appropriate fingerprint of the object, maybe some length considerations, in the identifier itself. So once you get the object from the identifier, you can validate whether it meets the appropriate checksums without having to know about the party that provided it. Either this is all based on trusting the encryption part of the schema. Uh, if it's a mutable object, obviously it's going to keep changing, so you can't put it in the identifier if the identifier never changes. But you can get that information out of the record from the resolution system. Um, so I, I won't go into the details of how you could do that, but um, the basic issue here is do you trust the resolution system or do you not trust it? And I think this is something that can be trusted because ultimately it's on the part of the party that created the information to maintain that information. And they could presumably change other things about that information uh, which they have no reason to want to do. So if it's banks, they want to keep the pri proper information. If it's publishers, they don't want to change the papers that they published. If it's laws, they want to keep. And you trust the parties that created it to maintain that appropriately. Um, so that's what I tend to talk a lot about at blockchain stuff. So let me say a few things about this two-stage resolution thing. The way we create identifiers is by giving an organization that wants to create them a number. It's a, typically a prefix that's a dotted prefix derived from a credential. So, you know, in, in, in the past we would say, okay, well, Purdue can have, I don't know, 1,015 um, and you create 1,015 slash whatever you like. So you can have any identifier system you now use and that identifier system can still be used. So it could be social security numbers, driver's licenses, license plates, it could be cryptographic strings, it could be whatever. 
Uh, you could even have semantics if you wanted, although we don't recommend that. But that then, uh, that system re allows an individual organization to create the local records. And so what you need to do is to get to their local records to find out what's going on. And it's under their control and management. So it's inherently a, a very distributed system. And those local services themselves can be mirrored uh, for reliability and security as desired. So there's a, a picture of showing it. Conceptually, this is a really simple system. You go into the system, and you get back this handle record, and that you interpret to figure out what to ne do next. I'm going to step you through this very quickly uh, just to give you a feeling for, it's like trying to describe a router to somebody. You can say simply, you know, it takes a packet in, puts a packet out, participate in some routing protocol. But conceptually, people spend a lot of time figuring out how to actually implement it. I could describe an operating system, too, pretty simply, but the details can be pretty complex. So I'm not going to go through every step here, but there's the handle system. There's a global registry that contains the prefixes. So there they are. And here are various uh, uh, services that are available. Um, these are basically, in today's world, uh, run by different parties around the globe. So the, the Global Handle Registry is run by a foundation that was set up in Geneva to make this attractive to you know, organizations and companies around the globe that did not want to rely totally on a US developed capability or managed uh, capability. So those services themselves uh, are run in different places. Um, and so you can go to any one of them if you want to resolve an identifier. And each one of those can be implemented in different ways with, uh, you know, they can have basic services and they can have uh, replications. And every one of them can be implemented differently. So here's one with uh, one, two, three, four, five. No, it's got in service, I guess, because it's dotted. Here's another one that's got a single server. Here's one that's got two. They can be supercomputers, workstations, whatever. But they're all distributed around, around the place. And so here's a client. They go into global. Global will say, OK, here's the information you need. You need to go to that guy. Uh, and that guy will get you to there, will get you to there. And back comes the information. You get some kind of an appropriate record, and you're done. So, Internally, it's been elaborated now over some 20 odd years. It's pretty interesting. The software is all available publicly. You can download it. The only thing you need to do to make use of it, except on an experimental basis, is get registered in this global registry. So um, that was a long discussion among people from government, private industry, academia. And that's we've been running that for 20 some odd years. and. We set up this, this foundation in Geneva and handed over that responsibility to the foundation. So that's now run out of Geneva. And it, what it does is it provides coordination, some software and other strategic services for development and, about, and the evolution of the digital object architecture. And it works with different groups on its application. And it has as a mission to pr promote interoperability between different kinds of uh, information systems. So it could be a weather system and a health system and a transportation system, a banking system and insurance system and so forth. And they can define them any way they like, but this provides a uniform way of interfacing between them. Um, this X1255 is something that a lot of them are relying on because it is a standard that is uh, now adopted globally, but at a very high level. Uh, that standard supports the core DO architecture standards. Uh, and the foundation kind of manages their evolution going forward. And they provide overall administration of this handle system, which is a particular implementation of the identifier resolution service described in the architecture. So uh, provision of GHR services comes from uh, an administration that is distributed with multiple administrators around the globe. So it's like, you know, you can have an organization like the FAA that's managing the air traffic, but they're not running the airplanes. And so the equivalent of running the airplanes is done by these administrators. And there are, there are currently about eight of them. We hope to get to 12 very shortly. Uh, it's got a very distinguished board that's administering this from around the globe. And uh, the, what they do is they give credentials to the administrators, and then they issue prefixes based on their, on their credentials. 
just to show you what physically happens. Okay, here are a collection of global records and they're identical. Every one of the administrators keeps a, a, a copy of them. But these are only the very high level ones. If you give lower level descriptions, uh, they won't show up in the global register. You have to go ask the local parties. But let's say here's CNRI is one of the administrators and we have, uh, so there's some party that they get a prefix. We put it in the JHR records and then we propagate it to all of the other administrators around the globe. The security in this system is particularly interesting. So here's another client, we take that in, propagate it, another client, we do the same. So here's another one, this is the the DOI Foundation is the organization set up by the publishers to deal with the DOI, so they can do the same for their different registration agents, put the information in, propagate that. Here's another one. This is GWDG is dealing with the big data and research data in Europe. It's, part of, it's uh, I think, uh, originally sponsored by the Max Planck uh, Society. And so they have different organizations they work with actually around the globe. They'll do the same thing, and so there's another one, and, and so forth. Donna itself, the foundation, puts in certain information pertaining to uh, uh, security, and th this whole system basically has been operating now reliably for almost three years, and uh, it really solves a lot of the problems of building a big distributed database where what happens in the middle is, is all interconnections between the parties that you know, we thought about using blockchain for that, but decided we didn't need to because this was as effective and, you know, is much more efficient. It's a lot of fostering of community interests. I just mentioned a few things. We work with IoT, big data, authentication, interoperability, but the foundation is right at the center of the coordination, but it doesn't do the work. The work is done by other parties. And I think, you know, we're going to see the internet really dealing with increased complexity elsewhere. This is one attempt to deal with a fundamental problem of information management. Uh, I think uh, trust in the system is important. I think we'll eventually see this mobile program technology show up again. But the need to protect these rights and values of interests uh, coupled with the sheer volume of information is really something that requires this new paradigm. So I think this digital object architecture is really important, can do the job, and uh, there are a lot of other things in progress. I, I'm not going to go through every one of them, but we know that things are gonna grow in many different dimensions. We're gonna have growth in terms of the number of objects, the actual amount of information, the need to rely on it, the need to have it persist. That's gonna stress almost every part of the internet as we now know it. And so if we don't have a good architecture for dealing with it, I think we're gonna have trouble going forward. But I think this can also benefit every organization that is willing to make the investment in managing its own information because it will stand it in good stead uh, going forward. So I, that's the last slide I had. I, on this slide packet, if you take a look at it, you will see there are a bunch of articles in the back that I commend to you that have to do with things that we have done or been involved with to try and explain some of this technology and uh, uh, I think you'll find it uh, interesting reading in your own right. So I think I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this interesting. And, and that nobody will ask me why we need identifiers. So you wanna take some questions? to the mic so that people who are streaming it will also hear the question. So. Um, so you mentioned about digital object identifiers, which sort of work very well if things are permanent. But my question is, can we afford to remember everything as we get more and more data being generated by more and more devices? Uh, can we compress this data? Can we afford to forget some of this data? Well, there are two parts of it. Um, I mean, one, you could be talking about the identifiers, um, but the information itself, that's a policy matter. That's not a technology matter. You know, whatever the policy is, you can probably find a technology approach to managing it within limits, of course. Um, I, I think that uh, 
the, the fact that there is so much information is challenging to some people who want to keep it around forever. And to other people, they want to forget it. If you talk to the lawyers, they'll probably say, get rid of it after a while, because you never know what the downside might be for keeping it around. Um, I come from a family where we never threw anything away, so I'm inclined to <laughs> want to keep everything. But that's not because the infrastructure requires it. It's just because it might be a, an, an interesting artifact about your life. I, there were some groups that were trying to develop you know, lifelong histories of people. They wanted to be able to create you know, the life log of people. And, and you, you, know, you only wanted it of the people who people would care about in the future. Well, who, do you, who are they? How do you know about them when they're two years old? So you keep a life log of everybody, and then you can decide which are the one you want to curate and which not. But probably every family will have some interest in keeping their own family archives uh, for as long as uh, they can afford it. I didn't think this was a shy crowd. Hey, uh, so uh, geez, how do you envision the interaction between DOIs and the domain name service? Do you, is there any interaction at all? Do you imagine there could be some interactions? Well, we use domain names all the time. I mean, because some people today have wanted to keep all their information on web sites, and so they give URLs, but they're in the handle record. So if they move it from place to place, they don't have to change things. Of course, if you're, if you're moving it from place to place and not changing the domain name, then you don't even have to change anything in the records because the domain name does that altogether. And to get back to the question that was just asked a moment before, I mean, I was the one that uh, put in place the transition to the domain name system, and we did that so people wouldn't have to remember all the IDs. Um, so you remember a simple, simpler way of doing it. I don't expect people to remember IDs at all. I mean, this is a, a bigger problem than remembering IP addresses. But that's where registries come in, and much of what the normal, the I want to say the average user of this kind of capability will want to do is take a particular identifier that's shown up. It's in a journal that they got, it's in a paper that they read, it's in you know, something that they can, they, they actually have tangibly in hand and, and want to go follow it through to get the actual information or whatever it is about it that they care about. Um, so that, that would be the typical operation. People who would be more interested in delving deeper will be the research community, looking for things from the distant past, trying, you're a, a, a you know, a, a builder, developer, and you're trying to put an add-on to a building that was built 50 years ago. And you want to get the plans for the building, and you want to know what laws applied then or now, and you want to put that all together, and you'd rather not make it a research project if you can avoid it. And I think this technology, if it's managed properly, will we'll avoid that. Now, everybody's going to have it. I mean, how many buildings do you have here on campus where you know, p people decide, well, we need an extension to the building, and you need to go back and find out what was in the original building and the like. And what people are now thinking about, we've actually built some systems like this, um, that they want to know everything that's in the building. And when I say everything, I mean not only the steel in the building and the pipes in the walls, but the carpet on the floors and what paint was used and where did you get the, uh, the HVAC system, what about the handles on the doors, and I mean, everything in the building. And you can easily imagine that can be managed as a digital object thing as if it's created when the building is created. You can find out everything about the building, including the plans of the building and the approvals and the codes and, and all of that that apply. So this is broadly applicable, and that's just one example. So uh, do you have connections with the Samvera community? So the Fedora open uh, repository where you know it would enable preservation of digital objects. And the other thing is like the DNA computing and quantum computing, given that you want to store all of these digital objects, uh, do you have an endeavor in, along the lines of you know, having these uh, innovative means of storage? So um, I mean, you could ask about the internet in general for applications of all kind and, and have you figured that out. We tried to keep this infrastructure at the minimum level so that when people had their applications, they could build on top of it. So the, the short answer is we could, other people could. 
for any particular example you give, but because we didn't want to tackle every possible example, including ones we couldn't think about, obviously, um, we haven't tried to do that. And you mentioned Fedora in particular. Let me tell you about the history of how that came about. When we built the very first of the repositories I just described, um, we built it in C back then. That was the language we used. Uh, and what we wanted to do was fund somebody else to build uh, an equivalent to demonstrate that the repository access protocol, which we were using at the time, would enable another repository done completely differently to interoperate. And so we funded Cornell to build that version in Java, and they called that repository Fedora. You know, in terms. So it really came out of our work. It is. Uh, it was originally compatible. We haven't followed it because they they took their own path. But uh, there was a very close synergy there when Carla goes and Sande Payette were there, and, um, and that was the background for that. Well, thank you. I think uh, this is all the time we have for questions because we have an event coming up next. So uh, the event is at three o'clock. We're going to have a panel. It's on the Internet Present and Future Policy and Technology Issues. It's in Walt Building, the Wilmoth Active Learning Center Building, room 3154. So that event starts at 3 o'clock, and uh, we have about 10 minutes for transition. So thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking you.